All right, we're live. <laughs> we had some trouble with the network. But here we are. We are going to share um, the strangest Christmas story you've ever heard. And uh, there's a lot of new people here, and we haven't kind of done an overview of things for a little while. We're not using all my presentation stuff. I just want to sit down and open the text and, uh, and share some things. Um, we're going to kind of bounce around a little bit. It's getting a bit warm in here. Let me turn the heat down. Um, somebody asked, actually, you know, how do you keep the, your, uh, the motorhome warm? Uh, we have a diesel. We, I have a diesel. Tiaki and I <laughs> have a, a diesel heater. And it's quite incredible, actually. So, uh, so let me... I, I shared some of my testimony a couple of weeks ago. And I'm not going to rehash all of that, but I'll just share a little tiny bit so people kind of have some perspective um, on where I come from and how I got here and where my head is at. And uh, so uh, I was born to a very young girl. Um, it was just before her 16th birthday. And um, this was in Auckland, New Zealand. And four years old she had had another three children one of them we only just found about eight years ago it was nine nine years ago it was kind of funny he was the second eldest none of us knew he even existed although we'd kind of heard rumors and then um she had another two children we moved to australia so i was four years old moved to australia um and then she kicked me out of home when i was seven we moved back to i was sent back to New Zealand to live with my grandparents. They took me straight to an orphanage and dropped me off from the airport. <laughs> and uh, I lived in orphanages and family homes. And there was a stint where during that time between the age of seven and 12, where I was sent back over to my mother for a brief period of time. And then I was back in New Zealand. Um, so when I was 12 years old, um, I was, uh, kicked out of I was offered a choice to become a, a ward of the state or um, or they didn't give me an option they just said would you like to become a ward of the state and I said no <laughs> um, and they said okay then fine and they gave me back to my grandparents who put me on a plane back to my mother um, within just a few days and then she kicked me out of home three days later and I spent almost three years living on the streets in Newcastle and Sydney of Australia and um, uh, and then I was rescued by a church and uh, went to seminary, became a pastor, ended up working for several different churches, was on staff at what is now called the Hillsong Church. Um, back then it was called Hills Christian Life Center in Balkham Hills um, in the Seven Hills area. Most of you know the Hillsong Church. If you're Christians, you, you know their music, you know Darlene Check and older ones might know Jeff Bullock, who was a great friend of mine. Um, and so I, uh, but I always had great difficulty with organized religion. And I, I kept seeing stuff in the text that no one was talking about. And I asked the questions that you're not allowed to ask. And, um, and I just, you know, I, I'm a curious person. And that's, that's my, my fundamental gift is that I'm curious. And I want to, to poke and prod and understand and discover and research and I'm, I'm, I'm not satisfied with not knowing, even if that's, it's okay to not know, you know, if, if that's all, all that can possibly be, but you want to try to find the answers to things. At least I do, and some of us do. And so, uh, in this whole process, I, I studied the text um, tremendously, and I, uh, when I was quite young, um, I would listen to the audio Bible, and I've done that all my life and still do it today. I listened to the Gospel of John just two days ago. I listened to the Gospel of Luke today in audio. Just go for a walk, I put it on high speed and it doesn't take very long. And so I've, I've devoured the text and become quite acquainted with it. And uh, I find it funny, and, and <laughs> funny when people that are kind of casual readers of the text try to correct me on things. Um, you know, I've, I've studied the text to the degree that I know that my understanding of the text is so minimal, it's so small. 
and yet people that have read the text hardly at all, they seem to know it very, very much. <laughs> and, and, and that's, that's always a, a funny paradox, right? The people that don't know the Bible think they know the Bible very well. And me that's read the Bible literally hundreds of times, I think I know it very, very little actually. So I don't come with arrogance and, oh, I know what I'm talking about. Well, the more you know, the more you know you don't know, right? And uh, that has certainly been the case with understanding the text. So um, my studies of the text brought me to an interesting place five and a half, maybe six years ago. And uh, I got to the point where I had to leave Christianity behind. And that's still the, the, my current position. And the reason was that Christianity is not supported by the text. It's an untenable position according to the text. And some people in Christianity will, will talk openly about the Roman Empire and the Roman influence on Christian belief, Roman universalism, Roman Catholicism. And, uh, but they really don't go far enough. And Martin Luther even nailed his 95 thesis onto the door of a church that listed as 95 problems with Roman Catholicism. And, uh, but he didn't go anywhere near far enough in what, in what he did. I left Christianity, but I never left Jesus, right? I never left Yeshua. And how can you? Because the revelation of Yeshua, when, when the Spirit has spoken to your heart, you, there is something so deep and real there that you, it's undeniable. So it was never about leaving him. But it was about leaving a system of religion. In, in some ways, it's, uh, Christianity is an explanatory mechanism, right? It purports to explain God, mankind, and everything in between. What I would say is that Christianity is a fairy tale that was created by Rome to shut us up and to stop us from looking for the truth about Yeshua. And it's done a brilliant, brilliant job of doing that. To the point where there'll be people watching this that are just gonna be switching off because they're hearing the things I'm saying about Christianity. They go, oh, I can't, I'm not listening to that nonsense. Goodbye. Who are you? Who do you think you are? Christianity has shut us up. We're told to stop questioning and just believe, have faith. Hmm. Well, I, I do believe in Yeshua. I have faith, hope, and trust in Yeshua. I follow Yeshua. But I won't follow a system created by man to conceal who he is. And that is what Christianity is. Now, when you first hear these things, as for some Christians, it's like, no, you can't divorce Jesus from Christianity. Oh, yes, you can and you must. Because if you don't, you will never know what the truth is. Right? Because Christianity frames everything. It provides a context for everything. It tells you what to think about everything. You come across a difficult passage. It says, well, this is what it means. Really? Why? Why does it mean that? That's not what it says. No, but I'm telling you, this is what a, this has been the Christian thought for 2,000 years. This is what it means. A lot of the time, people uh, will criticize me and they'll say, well, so you're correcting 2,000 years of, of you know, Christian thought and history and belief. And that's not really true. What we know as Christianity today is so divorced from what the early church believed, it's not even funny. And when we, when we start to consider the text, how long have we had this? We say, well, 2,000 years. Well, not really, because we're, okay, so, you know, between 1,750 and 1,900 years, you know, we're canonizing the text and putting these fragments together. And, okay, so let's just say 1,800 years. We've had the Bible for 1,800 years. But really, we haven't. Really, we haven't at all. Because until the Gutenberg Press came along, and Bibles started to be published, and people went against the church 
to print these Bibles. And finally, lots and lots and lots of people started printing Bibles. The Bible has only really been in the hands of the common man for the last 200 or so years. Now, you could say 400 years, yes, but only very wealthy people in the aristocracy had Bibles between 400 and 200 years ago. Only about 200 years ago did it become common that a household might own a Bible. And so now today, I mean, I have, I don't know how many printed Bibles I have here in, in the motorhome, but um, um, one, two, three, four, five, six, I think six in, in here. And then on my iPad, you know, I have several dozen different translations. And then, of course, online you can access you know, over a hundred easily. So we live in a very different era now where we, we did not, no one lived before. No one 200 years ago had access to a hundred versions on tap. Open up a web browser, go to biblehub.com and phew, it was just translations galore, right? So we live in a very unique time and, and people don't think this way. They think, oh no, we've always had this. No, we have not. It's imperative for you um, to read it, like to really, really read it. It's so important. The reason you're not going to know, you know, unless you've obviously been following me for a while, that you're not, not going to know many of the things that I'm going to share with you this evening is because you don't read it. And really, that's the only reason. It's not revelation. It's not that I have some secret source from the divine. It's just because I've read it. I've read it a lot. You can too. And if you say, oh, I don't have time, then just buy an audio, or you can get, get the free version that I make available for free, right? Somebody type the link in for me. Freebibleaudiobook.com Freebibleaudiobook.com When I was in ministry, I've been in ministry my whole life, right? So when I was in ministry, I worked with the, the God's Word to the Nations Bible Society. And, um, and I worked with them to uh, it's their translation, which is, you know, we've talked about it. It's kind of funny. It's called God's Word. Um, I worked with them, I think it was about 18 years ago now. Um, and I asked for permission, and I received it, um, to make the... Thank you, Jackie, to make the audio version of this available. You don't have to break it up. It's okay to put the whole link there. Facebook won't, won't hide it from anybody. Um, and they told me, yes, but <laughs> this is funny. But, you know, they said, yes, you can, but we only have it on cassette tape and we only have one copy. Okay, really? So I was in New Zealand at this time. Was I in New Zealand or Australia? Well, one of the two, it's hard to remember, but um, I think I was in New Zealand. Yes, I was, I was in New Zealand, okay. And they shipped me from the United States to New Zealand, these cassette tapes, right? The old cassette tape, I haven't even seen one for many years. Um, and I digitized all of those cassette tapes and I broke it all up into chapters and I copied and pasted the, the name so, you know, when you listen to, when you download it and listen to it, it'll say John chapter 1, John chapter 2. You'll notice that the John is the exact same in every chapter where it says John chapter 1. Um, because I had to copy and paste it. Otherwise, you just get chapter 3, chapter 4. And you're like, well, where am I? What book am I listening to? You know, um, so sometimes you just want to put it on random and... Um, so I, I chopped all that up and I gave it back to them and they've distributed my digitized version too. And, um, but you can download it completely free at freebibleaudiobook.com. So you don't have any excuse. And, and I, I've broken it up. Oh, I can't show you on my phone because I'm using it. Um, my other phone is dead. I don't think I've got it on here. Let me check if I do. Um... The way that I've broken all of the portions up is so that everything is in its category. So you've got minor prophets all together, you've got major prophets all together, Torah is all together, etc. 
Um, I don't have it on my iPad, but you'll see. So you can download Jesus, and it's the Gospels plus Revelation, right? Which is the revelation of Jesus to John, right? I encourage you to get that one at least, because there's nothing more important than being able to recognize his voice. And we start with the five questions. What did Yeshua say about himself? his father, what he came to do, where he came from, and what will soon take place. Those five things, right? What he said about himself, his father, what he came to do, where he came from, and what will soon take place. Those are my five questions that aid you in understanding Yeshua. Now you can leave the rest of the Bible alone. If you, if you go through those books with those five questions in mind, you will learn more about Yeshua in two weeks than going to seminary for four years. I guarantee it. It's not a joke. Um, and I, I so strongly recommend that you do that. There is nothing... All, all these people today, you know, in the church, everybody has a focus. And people are really into the Holy Spirit, or they're really into healing, or they're really into the cross, or they're, they're, everyone's got their focus, and that's great, I'm not criticizing that, I, that's a very good thing, because not, no one can be an expert in everything, and so we need people that that's their whole life attention, so they can share it with other people, and teach other people. But mine has been Him, and I encourage it to be yours too, because so few, I have met so, so few, where they had chosen that Jesus, Yeshua, would be their central focus of their Christian life. That that would be the one thing that enraptures them, that completely captivates them. And we need more people. Leave all the other stuff to everybody else. And I encourage you to pursue Him, to make Him your primary focus and attention and everything. And, and the reward of that will be incredibly sweet. So, I left Christianity... But not him. And then I started with my two questions. See, questions are very powerful. That's why I came up with the five questions, right? When you have those five questions, what did Yeshua say about himself, his father, what he came to do, where he came from, what will soon happen, what will soon take place? Um, those questions are not leading the witness. And I came up with two questions of my own, and they were, who are we? And what is the universe? Who are we? And what is the universe? And I started my search. And what I did is I started looking at videos that people had done where they were walking through ancient sites. These ancient civilizations that we have discovered and we continue to discover, including things like the pyramids in Egypt and underground in Egypt and all the sites that they keep discovering and opening. And I, I, I became fascinated with looking at all of these things all over the world. And I started to recognize from the things that a lot of the commentators were saying it was just baloney. They didn't know what they were talking about. And a lot of them were just making stories up. And so I, I would turn the volume down and I'd put them on my big screen and I would just, I would just watch. And I'd, I'd high speed the videos. So I start plowing through all of these videos of people walking with their cameras or their phones through these ancient archaeological sites. I wanted to see what was out there, what, what happened before, because that's evidence and it's real evidence. It's physical, empirical evidence. Right? And what happened is I started to, to put the dots together. I started to connect dots. I started to see all these similarities between all of these sites around the world. And then somehow, I don't even know how it happened, I stumbled upon uh, the, the works of... Um, I don't have it in reach. Um, oh. um, of Zechariah Sitchin. Zechariah Sitchin became fascinated with the Sumerian texts that we, we started pulling out of the ground about 180 years ago. So these are very fresh, right? They've been buried in the ground for thousands of years. These massively predate 
any of the oldest biblical texts we have, right? The book of Job in the Bible is the oldest book that we have. And these massively predate Job. Now that's interesting. Because when we look at the Bible, one of the, one of the, the sad things about the Bible, and I love the text, so don't get me wrong, but one of the sad things about the Bible is that none of this is from a primary source. And by a primary source, we mean none of it is from an original source. It's all from, they're all copies of copies of copies. Even the Dead Sea Scrolls are copies of copies. So we don't have a, a original handwritten papyrus. We don't have a, an original handwritten clay tablet. We don't have anything like that for the Bible. Not a single word in here, not one, unfortunately is from an original primary source. It is what it is, right? It doesn't mean we shouldn't read it. It doesn't mean it doesn't have a great level of accuracy, but we have to be, you know, fully honest about what we have. Not a single word in here is from a primary source. There are, there are also negatives that come along with that as well. So when we, we discover all of these original clay tablets, the original tablet that somebody many, many thousands of years ago, formed a piece of clay from a riverbank and, and had a, a, a pointed stick and they wrote onto these clay tablets what was going on in their day and what was happening. And then they ended up getting buried. And then thousands of years later, we come along and, and we start excavating these areas because we find these civilizations, these ancient cities, and we start removing all the sand, and we start finding all of these tablets. Now we have about quarter of a million of these tablets. Some are just like an inch square, and others are quite large. But they're pristine, they're, they're untouched, they're not copies of copies, they're, they're the originals. And so when we have the record of people that lived way before any of the biblical texts were written, and we know how to read this language almost as perfectly as we know how to read ancient Hebrew, which is perfectly. And we can look at this writing and, and start to learn the way these people thought, the stuff that was going on and we learn about what would have been the first major civilization after the global flood now more and more scientists today are starting to come around to admit that the the great deluge that happened 11,600 years ago very accurate on this date now uh, really did occur and that after the deluge not immediately after but some thousands of years after the deluge this incredible ancient city uh, arose and out of nowhere there's no prehistory to it we call it incorrectly Sumer today correctly it's Shuma but everyone calls it Sumer so we'll just stick with that pronunciation but um, this city it was like a modern Western civilization now we, we like to think that you know Western civilization came from Rome no Western civilization came from the ancient Sumerians they had legal systems, banking systems, completely sophisticated society, free market enterprise. Um, you know, people were treated justly and fairly and really wouldn't be any different to modern day America. But they also told us that the, the way they got there was from these other people that put them there called the Anunnaki. And we start to hear their stories about, the, they call them the gods, but they didn't quite worship them like a religion. They, we do have some poetry about them, which can seem a little bit like some of the Psalms. But, and, and they, did, they did often create uh, like places that were in their honor, like Trump Tower, but you really didn't find 
like a religion where people were going to services and you know, sacrificing animals and nothing like that. As we have been able to put all of these pieces together, a very, very peculiar story emerges. And the funny thing about that story is, is what, what I have been uniquely able to do, and certainly others have, you know, without their contributions, I, I wouldn't have been able to. Zechariah Sitchin, without a doubt, is, you know, has been the most helpful person because he translated a lot of these, these tablets into English. And he published them in a, in a series of seven books. Um, and one of them, which somebody mentioned here in the comments, is the first one, which is called The Twelfth Planet. Now, it's a, it's a strange title, and ignore the strange title. It's a book you must read, The Twelfth Planet. Now, some of Zechariah Sitchin's ideas are wrong, but not the general thesis. And there's even a website called SitchinIsWrong.com, and you can go check it out. These are born-again Christians, and the problem with Christians when they encounter this material is they try to shoehorn everything into Christianity, everything into the Christian worldview. Instead of expanding their understanding and going, wait a minute, this doesn't contradict the Christian worldview at every point. This actually confirms a lot of what we know, but it definitely does provide clarity on other parts as well. And some of those parts are definitely very uncomfortable for Christianity. But there's one thing that hasn't changed, and that is that Yeshua is the savior of mankind. So the story kind of goes like this in a nutshell. <clears throat> Where is heaven? Where is heaven? All right, where is this place called heaven? Is it a spiritual place? In other words, is, is, there, is it not material? Is it not like matter? Is it just ethereal? When we, when we read, like in John 18, when, when uh, Yeshua is having his conversation with Pontius Pilate, what does he say about his kingdom and where it is? Hmm? What does he say? He says, my kingdom doesn't belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. My kingdom doesn't have its origin on earth. Pilate asked him, so you are a king. Yeshua replied, you're correct in saying that I'm a king. I have been born and have come into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to me. So, we've got this man that was then resurrected from the dead. In a, in a real flesh body, he ate fish. He told Thomas, see the, the, the marks in my hands and the, the spear mark in my side. And, you know, he said, uh, I am not a ghost. A man, uh, you know, a ghost can't eat and isn't of flesh and blood. And, uh, and then he left, but he left in a real physical body. So where did this physical body go? If heaven is a spiritual place, what happened to the physical body? Did it just you know, immaterialize into vapor and, and go away? That would be an interesting uh, idea. But when we start to find all this other context, we discover that, oh, no, no, he absolutely is still today in a physical body. Because the ancient Sumerian texts tell us that this heaven that we that Yeshua here is talking about is a real place. We say, well, where is this place? Oh, it's another dimension. No. This is, this is something that Christians talk all about to try to make sense of these things that don't make sense because they're missing so much context. I'll say that UFOs and aliens are interdimensional demons. This kind of simplistic explanation, it's just it's not really an explanation at all. It's like, you know, invoking a, a Star Trek plot is, is, is just, it's immature and naive. It just doesn't interest me. I want real answers. I want to understand these things. Oh, interdimensional beings, demons. Okay, where's that in the text? Right, it doesn't exist in the text. Um... 
But of course, in the text in Daniel and Ezekiel, and, and when you know, we, we, we see the, the Bethlehem star over Bethlehem and it, it followed the, the wise men and then it stayed over the home, like stars don't do that, no, but a UFO can, right? Um, and then when we see the transfiguration, when we see Yeshua go up and on, on, on the Mount of Olives just before his death and, and he's surrounded by a cloud and white light, right? And we see Elijah and Moses standing alongside him. Um, you know, these kinds of scenes are the same scenes that people that have seen UFOs land on the ground have described. And it, it seems to be exactly what is going on here. Daniel and Ezekiel talk about these things as well. Right? We have the, the wheel within the wheel. We, we, we have the, you know, the, 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 the gods riding their, their chariots of wheels. And then we see these things today and we go, what, what are, what are we, I mean, everyone has kind of different ideas about it. But in the Sumerian text, we learn that they, these are people that live on another planet in our, in our star system. Now, some of this is going to sound a little odd and you just got to bear with me, right? Another planet. Now, now some of you know that NASA and Caltech have been working a long time on this. We know there is another huge planet that orbits our sun with an incredibly elongated orbit that we have yet been able to find. Now, I think they might have just found it in, in recent months or, or years, but, um, and you know, we, we should see it, I think, soon. We're, we're, I'm sure they're going to release information about it soon. Um, about four months ago, Caltech updated their study, which they had released about two and a half years prior. Uh, and NASA and Caltech have been working together on finding the planet. They launched a satellite about uh, a year and a half ago called the TESS satellite, T-E-S-S. -S. Now, we know mathematically the planet exists. And one of the, one of the best uh, science channels on YouTube, Veritasium, they actually recently did a whole video on this, and um, he went and met with, with people that were involved in the current research to find the planet. We know it exists. We know it exists because of the motion of the other bodies in the solar system. We also know it exists because the ancient texts tell us it, it exists and gives us a name. They call it Nibiru. That's its name. It's got a title. It's called the Planet of the Crossing. And we see it all throughout ancient architecture as this cross. We see it in the Egyptian Ankh. You say, why is the Egyptian Ankh the key to the afterlife, right? You know what the Egyptian Ankh is. It looks like a cross, but it's got a, a upside down teardrop on the top of it, right? Why is that called the key to the afterlife? The Ankh, with its three bars and then the inverted teardrop, is a representation of our solar system with the orbit of Nibiru on the top. Because Nibiru is heaven. Nibiru is where this other species called the Anunnaki live and reside. I know this is going to be a lot for you guys, but we're going to get to Jesus soon here. And, um, and when I start connecting these dots, some of you, there's going to be too much. You can't, you can't, no, I can't listen to this nonsense, Rob. He's returning soon. And doesn't, doesn't, you don't need to know any of this. Just put your faith and your hope and your trust in him and you'll be totally fine. But for those of us that are curious and would like to know more, then that's what I'm trying to do is bring more. But if it doesn't interest you, it's okay. You don't have to accept any of this. It's not important. It's just for those of us that are curious. And there's, if you're not curious, it's not a, not a negative. It's like, okay, whatever. It's just some are curious and some are not. But I'm curious and I want to know. When he said, my kingdom is not of this world. I mean... I want to know, well, what world is it of? I'm not satisfied with, you know, just, well, just believe and, you know, <laughs> no. I want to know. He gave me a brain. He gave me a mind. He gave me this curiosity. 
I want to understand. Nothing that I have found has degraded or devalued Yeshua HaMashiach. Not one thing. In fact, I've said this many, many times. When you start to understand this, when you start to understand this, you will start to see that the things that I have found and the, the, the growing story, the scaffolding of a story that we are, we're unpacking right now in real time, lifts up and elevates Yeshua more than Christianity does. Especially because Christianity makes some, has some awful beliefs. Some awful beliefs. And we'll, we'll touch on those in a little bit. You know, Christianity, you know, we have the story that Satan, the second most powerful person in the kingdom, tried to overthrow the kingdom and was cast down. The one who tried to set himself up as God. Well, that all makes sense from the Sumerian perspective. We know exactly who he is. We know his name. And Christianity has come along and taken this person, this enemy, this adversary of humankind, and said he is God. Now, that's the biggest mistake of all. That's like the f <laughs> There's no more fundamental mistake you can make. And so Christianity becomes untenable. I say, why are you not a Christian? Because Christianity tells me that Satan is God. And I know better. And I can show you in the text where it says this. And we've done many studies on this. I know there's a lot of new people always watching. See, when was Jesus born? Well, we just did a study on that the other night. So I'll let you go watch that after this. Um, but he was born, you know, he was born on the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Tishri 15. So the problem is we don't know what year he was born. So you'll have to work out what, what, what that is in the, in the Gregorian calendar. So, so let's, let's look at then at, at a nutshell of, of what we know so far. We're going to skip over so much, but it's okay. We're just going to give you a nutshell, because we don't want to take all night, right, um, of what has happened. And this will be very, very, very different to anything you've heard in the Christian story. But for a lot of you, this is going to resonate so like this. We, we see this experience happening where it's almost like someone is remembering this and they go, I mean, that, I've never heard that before, but I just, it's like I have heard that before. And like it rings true. It's like, what's with that? It's like, this is not make-believe. We're not inventing this. Right? This is in ancient texts. So let's go back um, 450,000 years ago. Yeshua, Jesus, had just terraformed this planet to make it habitable for life. And he comes into the Middle East on a large craft. I guess we would call it a UFO today. Technically, it means unidentified flying object, right? But let's just use that word. I know it sounds a little strange, but in a UFO, and just like these Tic Tac UFOs that the United States military has seen off the West Coast, and now they've actually said they've seen them off the East Coast as well. And these UFOs are able to just go straight into the water like it's nothing, right? They also said they're massive motherships that have been that they've seen under the water that were releasing these smaller little white Tic Tacs that these fighter jets have have filmed, and you know these fighter pilots have gone on TV and, and talked about, and the military has come out and admitted this is real. We don't know what they are. We don't know where they're from. So Yeshua's UFO comes and lands in the waters of the Middle East. And then they come aboard. They walk out of the water onto land. They don't live in the water, but the water is like, it's not like it is for us. They have totally conquered water. It's not a big deal to them. They're not going to drown in the water. They come onto the land, there's 50 of them, led by Yeshua. Yeshua, and some of this is going to sound like, whoa, whoa, okay, well, I'm sorry, I'll see you later. This is just for the curious people. But I promise here, nothing dishonors the Lord. I promise. So Yeshua and his wife, yes, wife, he is married. Yeshua and his wife come aboard, along with 48 others, and they start a civilization here on earth. Then more and more and more come here. And they start a mission here on earth to start mining minerals from the earth, particularly gold. They have a great fascination with gold. 
They first tried to extract it from seawater. They found it was just not, not efficient enough at all. So they, they decided, let's mine it from the ground instead. So they brought many, 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 as far as we can tell, hundreds of thousands of blue collar workers from their planet to, to Earth. And these people are called the Igigi, I-G-I-G, Igigi, yeah, I-G-I-G-I, -I -I, right? Now, some people have got all kind of different theories on what the Igigi are. I think they're blue collar workers. These are people that came and they worked the mines. And they built these massive civilizations that we find around the earth that massively predate humans. Right? There's a lot of civilizations we find that we can tell that, that they're much, much older than human civilizations are. Human civilizations really didn't exist until after the deluge. Now, humans were around before the deluge, obviously, and the Bible tells us so, but they weren't building these illustrious cities. Uh, instead, they were in smaller encampments. So, the Agigi come, this is about, still about 450,000 years ago, and they start mining the earth. About 132,000 years ago from now, from today, they had become tired, they were sick of the work, they thought there was, they'd been here for a couple of hundred thousand years, they thought there was no end to this, they thought, we, we want to go home. As much as Earth is a wonderful place, it's not our home. They have eternal life because they have access to the fruit of the tree of life. It's just one of their crops, right? We have the story in the Bible. We're going to get to that soon. And so there are these skirmishes that start to take place. They start striking. They lay down their tools. They say, we're not going to work anymore. This is all documented in the ancient text. Not, this is not a story we're making up. Okay, so they get together. The leadership gets together, the divine council, the leadership council gets together. And this leadership council is, is the, uh, the very Elohim that we find in the biblical text. Before we go to the creation of man, we're going to read Psalm 82. We read it the other night a, a little bit, but I want you to, uh, to see these people getting together um, and talking, right? Psalm 82, God takes his place in his own assembly. He pronounces judgment among the gods, plural. Now, you will find, if you search, you will find Psalm 82 is a very odd chapter of the Bible. It doesn't fit into the Christian narrative whatsoever, right? I guarantee you've never heard of Psalm 82 unless you've heard it from me before. Well, you need to go. Now you say, well, of course, I've read the Bible from cover to cover. Yes, but you probably didn't realize what you were reading. Now you need to go back and read Psalm 82. Right? Because it doesn't fit the Christian story. And you will find scholars that will say, or theologians, uh, commentators that will say, oh, it's talking about this and that. It's not really talking about what it says. And, and we do this in Christianity all the time, and it infuriates me. We turn what is plain and simple into metaphor, and we turn what is metaphor into literal. We've got to stop all of that, and just take the word, the words as they are, and, and read it as it is, and stop turning what is literal into a metaphor, and stop turning what is literally, a, obviously a metaphor, into something literal. What I mean by turning a metaphor into literal is, is when Yeshua says to Peter, you know, you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church. Oh, he's, he's, he's creating a pope. No, no, he's not doing that at all, right? And so we, we do it both ways. Why do we do it? Because so many things in here don't fit the Christian story. So let's continue reading. God takes his place in his own assembly. Now, actually, let me read this from the, uh, the English Standard Version. The English Standard Version uh, is, is quite a remarkable uh, Bible. And I love the way that it, it renders all of this. So let's go there. Now I need to change the translation. God has taken his place in the Divine Council. In the midst of the gods, he holds court. 
How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? And here we have the condensation of the ministry of Yeshua. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Verse 6. I said you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like humans, you shall die and fall like any prince. Princes were the first humans that were basically the apprentices of the gods that were to take over an area and become the next king, to take over from the, the god, right? Arise, O God, judge the earth or govern the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Now you think, what? what? I thought Yeshua was the, the son of the Most High. And isn't he the only son of the Most High? That's not what Psalm 82 says. Now, again, you will find people that will debate this and say, oh, no, it's not really saying that. Well, okay. You have to be able to be open-minded enough to look at all of the other possible contexts and go, okay, this commentator is saying it doesn't mean what it says, but we find all of these ancient texts that actually back up exactly what Psalm 82 is saying word for word. Well, that's interesting. So now you've got to wrestle with these two ideas. Well, I have this one scholar saying it doesn't really mean what it says. Oh, I find all these ancient texts that actually affirm that that's exactly what it's saying. Well, who's right? The modern scholar trying to make sense of it? Or these ancient texts that were written thousands of years ago, massively predating the Bible, that back up exactly what's written in the Bible? I'm going to go with these ancient texts, actually. Because the modern scholar, what's he lived? 60, 70, 80 years? whoop de doo Right? Big deal. So, we have this group of people... This word here, God, God has taken his place in the divine council. What is that word? God. The word is Elohim, right? The very first word used for God in the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. We'll get to that in, right, um, just next here. Um, but here we've got this, this first verse here, Psalm 82 verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds court. Now, if you're reading this along with me, you say, that says holds judgment. Yeah, I, I, I switch it because court is a better word, right? God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, plural, he holds judgment. Now, what's this other word for gods then? Well, that's also the word Elohim, right? So we've got God translated as a singular and then God translated as a plural, and then we can go down here and we say, I said you are gods. Wait, well, what's that word? That's Elohim as well. Wait, so we've got God translated singular and God translated plural, same word in the same sentence because of context. And this is the importance of context, right? You'll find people that will say, look, I don't interpret the Bible. I just believe it and, and I read it and I believe it and, and, and that's it, Right? But, but everybody, myself included, interprets what they're reading. You can't not. You're interpreting everything that I'm saying right now. Some people are going to get a very different message tonight than what I'm actually saying to you, right? Somebody else in another part of the country on their phone listening to this right now, listening to me right now, is going to hear something slightly different than what you are because they're interpreting it slightly differently. We always interpret through our, our own self all the time, right? I mean, you, you, you may have a fascination with a particular word, and I might use that word tonight some way, and, and your, you know, everything shifts around your interpretation, your understanding of that word compared to somebody else, right? Well, this is important. So context is important. Now, if you look up a Strong's, you will see that this word Elohim is by default a plural word it's not by default uh, a singular word okay it is not now you may go uh, um, you, you may want to argue but I mean you can just open up a Strong's concordance and you can look at the, the de dictionary definition now you may find some modern very modern in the last few years maybe the last 10 15 20 years Bible dictionaries 
that have removed the plural, but not many. Most of the older, like the recognized Bible dictionaries will tell you plain and straightforward that the word Elohim is default a plural, not a singular. Now, this is very important why I'm, why I'm stressing this so very much right now. Because we're going to go over to another verse where it's been translated as a singular, and it should not be. It should be translated as a plural. And that's a, there's a big problem with that. There's a really, really, really big problem with that. So, let's now look at this Elohim. This Elohim here in Psalm 82 is meeting together. They're, they're obviously, like, there's some of them that are not treating the humans very well. Humans that, you know... Could you imagine how much more intelligent Yeshua is to us? Right? I mean, just like, what do you, I mean, like, how could you even compare? Right? And that's exactly what it's like here. Humans were like cattle to them. Oh, before we, before we go on, you know what, before we go on, you know, wouldn't there be a record in, in the text? Wouldn't there be a record in the text if, uh, if humans were designed, uh, no, 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 we'll come back to it, we'll come back to it, we'll come back to it, we'll come back to it. <laughs> so I don't have any notes, I'm just going off the you know, top of my head, but, all right, so let's read uh, Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, we find the word, like in the beginning, God, Elohim, right? And we find the word Elohim used all throughout here, until we get to Genesis chapter uh, 2, verse Four. Well, how convenient. It's right over the page. That is very interesting. Uh, because actually, all of this is, well, these first two verses are from one fragment of text that was put together. This is, this is very agreed upon scholarship. Uh, and then the rest of, of this, from verse 3 onwards uh, to chapter 2, verse 3, is another scrap that has been compiled. And then we have from Genesis 2 4 and onwards uh, probably to chapter 11 is another portion of Genesis and then chapter 12 and onwards is yet a fourth portion of Genesis and these these little scraps well the first cup the first two are scraps and and then the others are more substantial have all been put together to form this one book of Genesis right and uh, I might I might show you a uh, um, a quick and dirty tr retranslation, for a more neutral, non-Christian translation of Genesis 1 and, and 2 here in a second. But let's go to uh, Genesis 1.26. And it says, Then God said, Let us make humans in our image, in our likeness. Huh. Well, isn't that interesting? What's the problem with this verse? What is the problem that, that is immediately obvious and apparent? If you've ever studied English to any level, you, you can see, well, wait, wait a minute. <laughs> well, that, that's not, that's, that's a terrible sentence. What is that? Then God said, let us, wait. Then God, singular, God, singular, said, let us, plural, make humans in our plural image, in our plural likeness. Now, the well-trained and indoctrinated Christian at this point will be saying, well, yeah, but, I mean, he's talking about the Trinity, Israel. Gosh, you're so dumb. You don't even know these basics of Christianity. <laughs> I've been to seminary. I've been in ministry my whole life. There's nothing you're going to tell me about Christian doctrine and thought that I am not aware of. I don't mean to sound arrogant, but this has been my life for a long time. You're not going to surprise me with Israel. I can't believe you didn't know this thing about the Trinity. And, oh, come on, what are you talking about? Okay? I know I get it. All right? Uh, you know... There's a lot more in the text to learn than there is in Christian doctrine and thought, right? You pick that up a lot quicker than, than all, all the rest of the text. So I, I know that's what you've been taught. But there is no Trinity. There's no Trinity in the Bible. The word doesn't even exist. When Yeshua was teaching people in the temple courtyard or out on a boat um, or amongst the crowds or anywhere, <laughs> he never to told them that the Holy Spirit was a God and that there was a Trinity, he only talked about his father. Right? When, when his disciples said to him, teach us to pray like John's disciples are taught by John. He says, okay. And he gives us the Lord's Prayer. 
When does he mention the Holy Spirit being God? He doesn't. He says his Father is God. Hmm. Right? So this idea of a trinity, I want you, you don't have to just throw it away right now. But just for a moment, just let it go and go, okay, I'm open to other possibilities. Show me, what, what else could there be? So this word here, God, is the same word we were just reading about in Psalm 82. It is the word Elohim. Right? So then Elohim said, let the earth, oh, wrong verse. Um, then Elohim said, let us make humans in our image, in our likeness. What if, we correct, what if we translated this word Elohim, God, as it is in the second place and again in Psalm 82, as God's, plural, as your Strong's dictionary will tell you it should be majoritarily translated, right? Then the gods said, let us make humans in our image, in our likeness. Oh, so in the ancient texts, we learn about a divine council. We learn about a group of 12. And in this group of 12, led by God, God the Father, who is the direct father of some of these people on this council, we learn that they are the people that are being talked about right here. They are the people that got together and had a conversation about creating humans. And it was Yeshua. That stood up at the council. When they were trying to resolve the problem with the striking Egigi. And said. We could create a man. To do the work for them. And the council deliberated this. And they agreed with Yeshua. Okay. Let's create a man. Let's create somebody that can do the work for us. And some of this can be uncomfortable, like what you're saying, that man was created to, to mine minerals from the earth. Yes. And we're going to read about it in Job 28 in just a moment. So the divine council got together. I don't know. I'm in the middle of nowhere and I can hear voices. So that's like really weird. It's very strange. There shouldn't be anybody around here. Um, so, <clears throat> sounds like they're riding bikes. So, uh, they get together and they decide that the way they're going to resolve the problem is that the Agigi are going to go back home because they are unrelenting. It's like, we're, we want out of here. We want off planet. Okay. So, they go back home. And the Divine Council, the Elohim, get together and they, with Yeshua, offering to create a man that would come and do the work for them. That's why Yeshua said, I no longer call you slaves. Right? And these things might be uncomfortable, but this is what we're finding. So, these people get together and they create the humans... To do the work for them. You think, I don't know. <laughs> Wouldn't that be in the Bible that humans are mining metals and things? I mean, how would that not be in the Bible? <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's in the oldest book in the Bible. It's in Job 28. Job 28. There is a place where silver is mined and a place where gold is refined. Iron is taken from the ground and rocks are melted for their copper. Humans bring an end to darkness there and search to the limit of the gloomy pitch black rock. They open up a mine shaft far from civilization where no one has set foot. In the shaft, men dangle and swing back and forth as on a rope. Above the ground, food grows, but beneath it, the food decays as if it were burned by fire. That place of stones is sapphire. Its dust contains gold. No bird of prey knows the way to it. No hawk's eye has ever seen it. No proud beast has ever walked on it. No ferocious lion has ever passed over it. Humans exert their power on the flinty rocks and overturn mountains at their base. They cut out mine shafts in the rocks. Their eyes see every precious thing. 
They explore the sources of rivers so that they can bring hidden treasures to light. What's that doing in the Bible? This is the oldest book in the Bible. This massively predates Genesis. We know because of the style of the Hebrew that's used in, in the book. Again, there's very little disagreement about that. Genesis, Exodus, Torah is not the oldest parts of the Bible. Je uh, the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. You can just Google that. You'll see I'm not, I'm not saying these things that are like, no one else says that. No. No, this is commonly accepted scholarship. Huh. So the ancient texts tell us that there is this divine council that they are the gods. Some of them are the direct sons, not all of them, but some of them are the direct sons of the Father. Hmm. And then we see that you know, in, in these ancient texts, we learn that they created the man to mine for them to take the place of their others. And then we see that actually in Job 28, it says this. And we see in Psalm, Psalm 82, where here it is talking about this divine counsel. It just blows your mind. It's like, what is this doing in the Bible? God takes his place in his own assembly. He pronounces judgment among the gods. You know, I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the most high. You will certainly die like humans and fall like any prince. Arise, O God. Judge the earth because all the nations belong to you. And you're like, wait, what story are you telling us here? And I've never heard this before. But we're not making it up. We're connecting dots from the past, from stuff that we're digging out of the ground. It's not just some fantastic story that I'm inventing. Right? Now, there are parts where I will be speculative in a moment and I will tell you that I'm being speculative. But everything I've told you so far is rock solid from, from what we find in the ancient texts. And we start to connect it all together with the biblical texts. <clears throat> so Yeshua comes first and then all these others come. Yeshua was the Lord of the earth and he was given a title. Enki. E-N-K-I. Enki. And the title literally means Lord of the Water. Now, Yeshua is completely fascinated with water, right? Everything is about water. All his miracles, almost all of them revolve around water. Uh, you know, just the, the, the first miracle, he, when he's baptized, he comes straight up out of the water. It's, it's like he stands on top of the water. People say the first miracle in the text is turning water into wine. That is not true. I don't even know why we say that. The first miracle was at his baptism, where it says he came straight up out of the water. He stood on the water, right? I've got a whole teaching on this called Yeshua, Lord of the Water, where we go into, um, let me just pull it up, actually. On, on my mind map and and uh, we can go over some of that um, because this is kind of a kind of a good good point to um, to bring out right now right so let's look at some of the things that Yeshua is connected to the water with right so we've got this this first miracle uh, in Matthew 316 and here it is in different translations right um, in the God's Word, it says, immediately he went up from the water. In the King James, it says he went up straightway out of the water, right? In the American Standard Version, it says, went up straightway from the water. In the complete Jewish Bible, it says he came up out of the water. In the International Standard Version, it says he immediately came up out of the water. In the New American Standard Bible, it says Jesus came up immediately from the water. In the NIV, it says he went up out of the water. In the New Matthew Bible, it says he came straight out of the water. So, you know, I'm not making this up. It's very clear that when he was baptized, he came up out, out of the water. He was standing on top of the water. Perhaps he was hovering above the water, but he was out of the water. That was the first miracle. The second miracle was turning water into wine. And then there's all of these other miracles that occurred. So many of them in involving water. He could traverse water at tremendous speed. You remember when um, 
he said that he wanted to pass them by. The, the, the disciples were in a boat and they were crossing over to, I can't remember where right now. And, and, and he said, uh, the text says, I wanted to pass them by. Why did he want to pass? Because the boat is slow compared to him. He's a master of water. There's another episode where um, they, they, they woke up in the morning. Yeshua was there. They saw all the other people crossing over on boats. They saw that there were two boats left. They saw that uh, when it was time for them to go, that Yeshua was nowhere to be found. And they took the last boat over there. There was no, no one else around. And then when they got to the other side, they noticed he had already been there. And they went to him. This is recorded in the text. How did he get to the other side? How did you get here? Right? When, when the wind came and, and caused the sea to be rough, he spoke to the sea, to the water, and the water was calm. He, he had a conversation with this woman at the, Sumerian, the Sumerian, Samaritan woman at the well, and he, he says that if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for the water of life, and you'd never thirst again. And so he talked about himself as the water of life, when he was pierced on the cross, it wasn't just blood that flowed out of his side. It was blood and water. And in these ancient texts, this character that was the first one that came to earth with the party of 50 and landed in the water, came out. His title was Enki, E-N-K-I. And it means Lord of the water. That's what Jesus is. He's Lord of the water. And when you see, when you, when you read more and more about this particular character in these ancient texts, you realize they're not talking about some mythological figure. They're talking about somebody, a person. And they're, they're telling you about his characteristics and what he does and the way he talks and all of these things. And you start to see that the way he talks is exactly identical to the way Yeshua talks and all of their character and personality and their abilities and the things they want to do. The fact that in, the old, in these old texts, these ancient texts, it says this is the one that created man. And then we read in John 1 that Yeshua is the one who created man. And, and you get all of these things and you realize they are, you can't help but not realize these are exactly the same person. That Enki, and his name is Ea, Enki Ia in the ancient texts is our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, the one that died for us. And when we continue here, it'll all start to come together. This is the real Christmas story. <laughs> Are you enjoying this? Are you getting something out of this? So... <clears throat> So in this divine council, there are ranks, right? There are ranks of these, uh, these people. We could talk more about Yeshua and water, but uh, we won't just right now. Um, let's see, let me do something here. Um, It's not searching inside of them. Okay, hang on. I want to show you a little chart here. Let me just find it for you. I have so many mind maps. You know, I make so many of these things. It really helps to uh, put all of my thoughts together to have these mind maps. Maybe it's... Let's see what we have here. Some of them get really big. I'm scrolling around them. It's just kind of huge here. But, but they have a family tree. And, uh, and a lot of them are known. <clears throat> Let me just fold this one up. And so here is, <clears throat> here is this, uh, OK, 
council, the Elohim, the council of the Anunnaki. How well you can see that there. You can see Anu is at the top. And he's got a ranking of 60. Antu is his wife. She has a ranking of 55. Now, the female rankings, they really, they're attached to their husband, so they really don't have much of a... Uh, they're always involved, but it's... There's, there's no real chauvinism that I've ever found in these ancient texts with the, the husbands and the wives. They, they, they operate as one. And so, but you'll see here, you've got Enlil, Nunamnir. I've mirrored the screen so you could see these properly. It just makes it a little harder for me to <laughs> orient what I'm doing. Enlil, Nunamnir, and then enki Ear. So this is Yeshua. This is our Lord. Well, wait, that's interesting. Now, this is all in rank. So that means that Enlil, Nunamnir is the second in charge, and Yeshua is not. He's the third in charge. Oh, well, that's interesting. We have the story that Satan, the adversary, and we have this caricature of Satan, right? This evil spirit that's going around persecuting people. I want you to, to it's, not, it's, it's not really like that in the Bible, so just let that go. The adversary is the the adversary of humankind doesn't like the humans at all and in this this christian idea we have which actually isn't in the biblical text is that satan was the second most powerful person in the kingdom of god but he wanted it all for himself he was proud and arrogant And he got a group of people together and tried to overthrow the kingdom. Now, where is, is that idea that he's the second most powerful in the kingdom? And, and where, where does that come from? It's not in the Bible. It's no, nowhere in the Bible. Well, we see that it comes from Greek and Roman mythology, actually. Right? We see that in uh, Greek mythology... We have Zeus overthrowing Kronos. And then, Kron and then uh, Zeus establishes his kingdom here on this earth. And in Roman mythology, we have uh, Zeus, uh, sorry, we have uh, Jupiter overthrowing Saturn. And Jupiter establishes his kingdom here on earth. Now that's interesting because. Uh, these two characters are exactly the same, and even people that study these mythologies know well, the, the Greek and the Roman gods are interchangeable. So we know that Zeus is Jupiter. We know that Kronos is Saturn. Huh. So that's where that idea comes from. But wait, he's the second most powerful? Yes, because Zeus and Jupiter are in Lil Nunamnir, the second most powerful in the kingdom. He has the rank of the second most powerful in the kingdom. Everything fits together. The only reason why we haven't connected all of these dots before is because none of us are familiar with any of this stuff. We've never heard of it before. It's completely foreign to us. So then when we start to look at it all, you start to see, wait a minute. The Greek and Roman pantheons of gods come together exactly. They're all they're the same people. Yes, well, wait. Isn't Yeshua then going to be in, in those, that pantheon then? If, if Anu and Enlil Nunamnir, if they, if they are in the Greek and Roman pantheon, if Anu is Kronos and Saturn, and Enlil Nunamnir is Zeus and Jupiter, Wait, wait a minute, does that mean Yeshua, our Lord, is also in the Greek and Roman pantheons? Yes. <laughs> Who's the Lord of the water in the Greek pantheon? Poseidon, yes. Who's the Lord of the water in the Roman pantheon? Neptune, yes. Sounds crazy. 
everything comes together, we start to realize what's going on. When you, when you go to the Capitol building in Washington DC next time, look up at the top of the rotunda, it's painted, it's got these massive murals. See, I lost about 10 people in saying, oh, I'm, I can't hear you. Oh, gotta be curious, gotta be curious. Go to the Capitol building. Some of you are going to be there January 6th. I guess they're not going to have the Capitol open, though, for, for visitors um, on that day. But, but if you look up, you can find images online. I, I have some high-resolution ones saved. You'll find that some of these gods are there, including Neptune. Oh. Well, that's interesting. Wendy here makes a comment I want to respond to. I'm trying not to look at the comments because I get so distracted I've looked at hardly any, but uh, she says, I believe he was God's beloved angel. All of the angels are the Anunnaki. There is no special angel. When we look at these guys, when they're carved into solid you know, stone and we see their reliefs from the ancient world, um, I don't know if I have any handy on my iPad right now, but I, I might see if we can find any here. Or I can just Google it. Um, but all of these, all of these people are the angels. Now, Michael and Gabriel are different, but all of the angels, you know, when it, when it says... And the angel of the Lord came to Jacob, and he wrestled with the angel. Who was that? Was it an angel? Yep. But it's also one of these Anunnaki. I don't have any images here, but, uh, you know, I, I've posted many images um, all over the place. And you can see the way that they're drawn with wings. Now, they don't have wings, literal wings on their back. Uh, but they're drawn that way. Why? Well, that's where we get the, the idea of angels from. Right? So, where are we at now? So, we're starting to make all these connections. And we realize that, that this Christian Satan, the second most powerful in the kingdom, we've identified him. We know who he is now. We know that he is Enlil Nunamnia. That's his original name in the Sumerian. Now, that's probably not their language. It appears they don't have a language. When we look at their their civilizations that they built before the humans came along, then you're going to find, like in Egypt, in ancient Egypt, not well, when it was Memphis, not not when they reclaimed it after the flood, which is what happened, right? Um, there was no language in all of the pyramids. There's no inscriptions in Egyptian hieroglyphs of any kind. When we go to Petra and Jordan, we look at all of this pristine incredible city that was carved out of rock with perfect facets i mean just absolutely unbelievable not one word of writing not one letter of writing why it appears they don't use language the way maybe it's telepathic i don't know but they don't use language the way we use language so what does it mean that we now know that Enlil Nunamnir is the christian satan Let's continue the story. So, I'm going to lose more of you now. <laughs> so we've got this, this guy that has rank over Yeshua. Yeshua is the third now, when, when they're, when they're seated, ne se seated next to their father, the father's right hand is where the senior sits. That's where Enlil Nunamnir sits. And on his left hand is where Enki Ea sits the third most ranked son. You say, wait, wait, God has two sons? Well, we read about that in Psalm 82, remember, right? He talks to, to the gods. There's multiple ones. He says, you are all sons of the Most High. 
And there are other sons too, but these are the two most important sons. And these are the ones the story revolves around. So you know when Yeshua says that I will be seated at the right hand of my father? Because in Lil Nunamnir was Satan, or is Satan, was second in charge, was sitting at the right hand of the father, but rebelled and tried to overthrow his father's kingdom, just as Yeshua told us. And now Yeshua is going to be seated at the right hand of the Father. Because Enki Ia, Yeshua HaMashiach, is the one that came and died to free humanity. From whom? So, the humans are made and they're dispersed all over the earth. All of the races are perfectly accounted for. Everything that we read in the ancient text lines up with our scientific understanding of DNA and what happened. And we see that the black African was the first human created. They were created approximately 132,000 years ago. I'm sorry if you're a, a literal 6,000 year young earth creationist, but that's not the way things went down. I mean, we've got so many structures on the planet that are so much older than 6,000 years, it's, it's not even funny. So the African was created and the African mined the gold mines in Africa. In recent years, a pilot and, uh, who had been seeing these things from the air contacted uh, an archaeologist, and they got in their plane, they started flying over uh, the ground, and they could see that they were uncovering this massive <clears throat> network of ancient structures. Well, now more research has been done. A lot of them you can just see on Google Earth. Now we know where to look. And you can see that all down one side of Africa and all up the other side, we have all of these kind of structures that are made from rocks that are made for containing animals and obviously living areas, houses, and so forth. And we see a road network that goes all the way down one side and all the way up the other. And we have found the actual gold mines. The mines are still obviously mines. They have lasted a long time, 132,000 years. And all of these mines are still intact today. But some of them you can see where they've pulled out huge veins of gold from them. Very, very interesting. And so... It's one thing to have these ancient texts, or might maybe it's just a fairy tale, and maybe it is. But then we start finding all the other evidence that supports it. It's the same way with the with, with the biblical text, right? With the biblical text, we have this these ideas of where well, it says David's city is going to be here, and people go looking. Oh no, it can't be. It's going to be somewhere else. And then someone goes, you know, why don't we just go and excavate exactly where the Bible says it should be? And oh, lo and behold, we find it. Oh, how funny. And now we're doing the exact same thing with these older ancient texts. And we're finding that these structures that were the very first, most primitive structures we can find on the planet are still there. 132,000 years old, but still there. It's amazing. Then they created pockets of humans for different areas all over the world. Now we'll get a little bit speculative. I told you I'd speculate a little bit here, and I'll tell you when I'm doing that. So it appears that Yeshua made a last final group of humans for him. And in some part of this process of creating his own humans, now he had created his own humans for other things before, okay? But for some reason he was quite proud of this final group of humans that he was creating. And that is when his brother, Enlil Nunamnir, the Christian Satan pulled rank. This is before he overthrew the kingdom or attempted to. He pulled rank and said, I'm the second in charge and I'm going to take over lordship of earth. And it was given to him. Only begotten son, only begotten, only son born of a woman, the only one that came as a human, right? 
somebody asked that question, explain only begotten son. But you see, when you come to things like that, you've got to, to appreciate. But we've got other parts of the Bible, like in Psalm 82, that are talking about the other sons. So you, you've got to resist this, like, but wait, what about this gotcha verse? No, you've got to understand that everything's got to be understood in a context. And now we've found other verses that very plainly say that God has multiple sons. Well, then how does that factor into that? Well, that's the thing. And you, you will bump into things like this from time to time. You know, but what about this and what about that? What about the context? You've got to bring it back to the context. And a lot of it, we, we have to re-examine it all because we've been so indoctrinated into this Christian idea of thought. Now we have to go, wait, maybe there's a different explanation here. And maybe it's not immediately apparent what that, but it doesn't matter because we're starting to unpack, we're building the scaffolding of this other story and the, the evidence that is supporting all of this is so powerful, it's so strong. And we can't just let one verse come and bankrupt. Now this one doesn't because it's very easy to understand, but there are others where you might go, well, what about this one? Or what about that one? It's like, yes, but understand the context of what's all coming together here. Right? If you go to any um, ancient Hebraic scholar who has studied, whether they're a, a, a Jewish rabbi, uh, whether they're just a, they have a fascination for this area of studies, many people around the world that have done this, and you start looking at the ancient Hebrews, well, you'll see they didn't always worship Yahweh. They worshiped all kinds of gods. That this idea of monotheism is, is you know, a relatively new concept. That somebody came along and said, I am God. Oh, well, that reminds us of somebody. Huh. Right? So let's keep, let's keep moving. Um, I didn't mean for this to be this long, but we're going to, let me, let's just try to catch up a little bit here, okay? So, uh, so we have the second most powerful in the kingdom, and he pulls rank, and he says, I'm in charge now. I'm in charge now. And that is where we end up in Genesis. So what we find here is that we have this creation story in Genesis 1, and then we find here in Genesis 2 from verse 4, there is a brand new creation story being told, a retelling of the creation story. So we read in John 1, uh, in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created heaven and earth, etc., etc., and then in Genesis 2, 4, it says, this is the account of heaven and earth when they were created at the time when the Lord God made earth and heaven. It's like, wait, we just went through all that, didn't we? Yes, we did. We just went through all of that, actually. Now we're starting all over again? Why is it starting all over again? It's like, that's odd. It's like somebody is retelling the story from their perspective. Interesting. Now, what if we start looking at some of the Hebrew words for God and see, well, we've got this God here in the beginning, that is the Elohim, right? The council. The divine council that we read about in Psalm 82. Same word, Elohim, right? There's, there's no discrepancy there. But then we start in Genesis 2, chapter 4, and it's like, wait, this is the account of heaven and earth when they were created at the time when the Lord God, Lord God, huh, made earth and heaven. Now, it's unfortunate that we just start to, to translate these words and we, we, we turn them all into one word. Why don't we keep the original words in the text? We could use the, the transliteration of the word. So where it says here in verse 4, Genesis 2, chapter, chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, and it says, Lord God. Well, the word God has changed. Before it was Elohim. Now it's Elohim Yahweh. The Tetragrammaton is first introduced into the biblical text. yod heh vah -Hey. Right? What well, we translate as Yahweh, and your King James, it'll translate it as Jehovah. 
right? Which is a terrible, it's, there's no justification for translating it like that. But, but um, King James, not a good Bible. I know the King James people will be upset with me for saying that. It's the only Bible, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's a terrible translation. It, it, doesn't, it can't even get the name of Yahweh right, for, for Pete's sake. Um, so in Genesis 2, chapter 4, we have a new person on the scene. Well, what does it mean when it says Elohim Yahweh? It's saying divine council member Yahweh. Huh. Div wait. So like he's, so Yahweh, wait, so Yahweh is in here somewhere. Yahweh is in this list somewhere. Where does, which one is Yahweh? Are you starting to connect the dots yourself? Which one is Yahweh? We well, see, in the ancient text we read that someone has now pulled rank. And he's now taken over the authority of earth from Yeshua, right, from enki Ia. Well, we know that's Enlil Nunamnir. Enlil Nunamnir has now taken authority. He's pulled rank. But isn't he Satan? Yes. And he's also Yahweh. And we have a whole study on this. You should watch Two Gardens and the Snake if you're like, oh, I can't handle this. Yahweh is, is Satan. Who killed humans en masse? Who had to come and die to free people from Yahweh's law? Who told you Yahweh is the father of Yeshua? Yahweh never mentions even having a son in the whole entirety of Torah. Don't you think when the son comes and he can't shut up about his father, he says, I am the father of one, I only do what I see the father doing, I only say what the father has told me to say. Yeah, they, they're tight. They're like this. How is it possible that Yahweh never ever mentions Jesus or Yeshua? How? What about in John chapter 8 when Yeshua is talking to the Pharisees? Like in John, let, let's read it. Your mind is reeling. Yes, I know. You've just got to keep, got to keep going. Right? The more of the big picture you start to understand, the more, more concerns you have will be resolved. Because this all makes sense. But there's a lot to relearn. There's a lot to unlearn. Right? It does take time. So here in John 8, the Lord is having this discussion with the Pharisees. <clears throat> and he said, uh, he says to, to the Jews, you're doing what your father does. And they replied and said, we're not illegitimate children like you. God is our only father. And Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me. After all, I'm here and I came from God. I didn't come on my own. Instead, he sent me. God sent me. And then he says this, you come from your father, the devil. Now, and you'll find all kinds of commentary on this, trying to do exactly what I was talking about before. Take the literal, simple words of Yeshua and try to turn them into some crazy metaphor to explain away what Yeshua is saying. Well, the Jews were following Satan. They were following Satan? Really? The Jews were following Satan. They had a temple. They were, they were studying Torah. They were reading Yahweh. I mean, they, they were worshipping Yahweh. They were sacrificing animals to Yahweh. They were following Yahweh's law to the letter. They weren't worshipping Satan. Well, these they were, but not in the context that, you'd, that many people tried to use it as, a, as an argument. I mean, this is a really rich period of Jewish history. Right? 
They were flat out. They had, they had a temple. They were worshipping Yahweh. Yeah, they had the Shekinah presence. They had the Holy of Holies. And here Yeshua is saying, you come from your father, the devil, and you desire to do what your father wants you to do. The devil was a murderer from the beginning. He has never been truthful. He doesn't know what the truth is. Whenever he tells a lie, he's doing what comes naturally to him. He's a liar and the father of lies. You know, when it says that he was a, a liar, from, a murderer from the beginning, this word beginning is the word Genesis. Now, obviously, this is in Greek. But see what's going on here. Yeshua says, your God, your father, was a murderer from the beginning. Beginning. What does the word Genesis mean? Beginning. Your father was a murderer from Genesis. And you start to see how it all fits together. Yahweh pulled rank. That's why his, he was the second most powerful. He had every right to it all. He pulls rank and said, I'm going to be in charge of the earth now. And that's when he instructed Yeshua's creation, who he had put into a garden. Right? He said, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden, he wasn't originally there to farm the land and to take care of it. And the Lord God, this is Yahweh, Elohim Yahweh. You can look it up in the Hebrew if you want and see. The, the, the Lord God, or uh, Elohim Yahweh, commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden. You must never eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So then the snake comes along and says, you won't certainly die. From eating this fruit and that was the truth they did not why did the man and the woman eventually a long time later die because someone kicked them out of the garden where they no longer had access to the fruit of the tree of life he was a murderer from Genesis you think, no, 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 he's talking about the snake. He's talking about the snake. He, the snake was the one that tricked them and deceived them and, and, you know, because of that killed them. Well, we have a whole teaching on this two and a half hours long called Two Gardens and a Snake where I go into this, we go all, step all the way through the text. And I really encourage you to go through this. So tonight we're not going to spend two and a half hours going going all over it again. We're just going to skip over it. So if you, if you, uh, well, you just you should anyway. Make sure you go watch my study. It's the one study I've done that's completely blown people's minds. Um, two gardens and a snake, and we go through the Garden of Eden story, right? Well, let's go through it quickly, just now. So, um, then, um, ba -ba -ba -bum. the snake was more clever than all the wild animals. He asked the woman, "Did God really say you must never eat the fruit of any tree in the garden?" The woman answered the snake, we're allowed to eat the fruit from any tree in the garden except the tree in the middle of the garden. And God said, you must never eat it or touch it. If you do, you will die. The snake replies, you certainly won't die, the snake told the woman. God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And it's amazing the number of Christians that I've, I've come across that have read this and going, see, that's a lie. You're not going to be like God. What are you talking about? Yahweh himself says over here in verse 22, this is Genesis 3. Then the Lord God said, this is Elohim Yahweh said, the man has become like one of us since he knows good and evil. So yes, he absolutely did, right? Yes, God was angry because the snake had opened the eyes of the humans. Is, is that a bad thing? You've been told it's a bad thing. You've been told to believe it's a bad thing. In what possible way is it a bad thing? The snake never lied. 
Now we'll find two times in the New Testament because it's the Jewish tradition where it says, like the snake deceived the woman, because it's the Jewish tradition. But where in the text does it say that the snake lied? Nowhere. You think, no, I know it. Okay, well, you can go through it and you can go through my study and we go through it verse by verse by verse, but you, you can just read it. The snake never lied to the woman. The snake told the truth, and we know this because Yahweh affirms it. Right? He says, okay, so this is what the snake said. Um, <clears throat> you certainly won't die. God knows that when you eat it, your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Well, this is what God repeats. Yahweh repeats. Verse 22, the man has become like one of us since he knows good and evil. What did the snake lie about? He, he said exactly the same thing Yahweh affirms. He didn't, he didn't misspeak. He didn't lie. He didn't deceive the woman at, at all. So, we've got the snake that comes along and says, no, you can have access to all of the fruit in the garden. And you'll have eternal life. You'll live forever because you've got access to the fruit of the tree of life. And your eyes will be opened. You'll be like God. Okay. Okay. And then we go to the very last page of the very last book of the Bible. And it says this. The angel showed me a river filled with the water of life as clear as crystal. It was flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. Between the street of the city and the river, there was a tree of life visible from both sides. It produced 12 kinds of fruit. Each month had its own fruit. The leaves of the tree will heal the nations. There will no longer be any curse. Wait, but when we go back to Genesis... Wait, there no longer be any curse? Hang on a second. What's, what's that all about? The ground is cursed because of you. Through hard work you will eat food that comes from it every day of your life. Huh. Because uh, uh, you, you will, uh, by the sweat of your brow, you will produce food to eat until you return to the ground because you were taken from it, you were dust, and you will return to dust. Huh. Yahweh is cursing the humans and telling them, you're going to die now. Yahweh cursed them. Who's the one that restores them? Who's the one that restores them so that they have access to the exact identical uh, state that the snake wanted for them in the garden? Yeshua and his father. The Christian story is just wrong. It just ignores all of this. It hasn't connected these two dots. That the very opening parts of the whole Bible in Genesis with the Garden of Eden story is resolved in the very final page of the Bible. And we can see the snake wasn't Satan. The adversary of humankind, the one that killed them, the one that cursed them, is Yahweh. He's the adversary of humankind. The one who came and gave his life to restore humanity, to set us free from that curse, from death, to give us access again to the fruit of the tree of life back in the garden, is none other than Yeshua and his Father. The snake in the garden is not Satan, the snake in the garden is Jesus. Do you see? It's in the Bible. It's in the text. All these people I'm losing right now are like, read your Bible. It's right here. Oh, it goes completely against everything you've ever heard before. But it's right in your Bible. This is not the Mormon Bible. This is not some cult Bible. This is in every Bible. It's in your Bible. Why does Christianity not tell you about the restoration in the second garden? Why is that not the 
most fundamental, like, you know, there's, there's, there's five or six fundamental things, right? I mean, there's the birth of Jesus, there's the crucifixion, the resurrection, and, you know, salvation of humankind. Okay, but what's the end result? The end result is restoration right here in the very last page of the Bible. And the church doesn't even talk about it. You go to church your entire life, die in your 90s, and you won't hear a single sermon on the last page of the Bible talking about the restoration of humankind and, and making this point that like, hey, here in the opening parts of the Bible, we were cursed by Yahweh to die. He's the one that murdered humans. In John 8, Yeshua says he was a murderer from the Genesis. And then here is Jesus in the last page of the Bible. He has died on the cross, become the curse for us. Cursed is every man that is hung on a tree. And he restores us back to the exact identical state that the snake created for us in the garden. Yo, you have it all. You have it all. Everything is yours. You're my people. You can have every fruit from the garden. It's okay. And Yahweh says, no. Why? Because he had humans in bondage and he didn't want their eyes to be opened. <gasps> Wait. Oh my God, we're naked. Oh, they could see. The knowledge of good and evil. Yahweh was being evil. He had them in bondage. And they couldn't tell. It was like a, you're a, a dog in a crate. They don't, they just, they're happy to come out and see you, but they don't know that you've got them in bondage. They don't know that's a bad and evil thing. They don't like it, but they have no concept of good and evil. And Jesus comes along and opens Pandora's box. He says, you need to see what state you're in right now. You're trapped. You're in bondage. Eat from that fruit, from that tree you were told not to eat from. Oh, no, but he said we can't because in the day we'll die. He's like, he's probably not aware of the conversation. He's like, what are, what are you talking about, die? You're not going to die from eating. What? He told, Why would he tell you that? You're not going to die from eating from the, the fruit of the tree of, of good and evil? The knowledge of good and evil? No, you, it's not going to kill you. What do you, no, no, eat, eat it, eat it. Then their eyes were opened. And they can see. It's not Christianity, that's for sure, but it's all from the Bible. It's all in your Bible, not some wacky cult version I have. No, from every Bible. What's going on? Why does Christianity not, not have its primary focus on the fact that humans were cut off in the garden from the fruit of the tree of life and they are restored to the fruit of the tree of life at the end? Forget everything else I've said. Just consider why this story that brackets everything else, this story that provides the context for every other part of the entire human story. Nothing else is outside of it. It brackets everything. Literally, 100% of everything. Why does Christianity not talk about it? Like, literally, it's just not, it's just like, what? I've never heard this stuff before. Why? Like just that one thing alone. Forget everything I've ever said tonight except for this one little thing right now. Why does the church ignore this? It's the story. There's nothing bigger than this. It's the story that brackets everything. Everything happens between these two points. It's, it's, the, it's the beginning and the culmination of the human story. But the church completely ignores it. Why? Because you'll start to connect the dots. You'll start to realize the snake is not Satan at all. It's the God in the garden. It's Elohim Yahweh that became the hater of humanity. It started to kill them. It is Yahweh that decided to bring a flood and wipe them all out. It's Yeshua that we find in the ancient text. It was Enki Ia that came to Zia Sudra or Noah and in, in other um, civilizations around the earth as well and said, build a boat. 
because a flood is coming. Because Yahweh is going to kill you. Build a boat and tell everybody to get in the freaking boat. And we read about this whole story in the ancient text about the flood. It gives us way more details. Yahweh wanted to kill all the humans off. Enki Ia, one Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, wanted to save them all. Yahweh is the adversary. Yahweh is how bent on killing us. That's his modus operandi. That's what he's done from the beginning. He's killed us. And Yeshua put his own life down. And he said, well, now he can kill me. And I will be the one that dies for all of them. That's the real Christmas story. You know, the, the many things that I've said tonight you can struggle with. It's going to be really hard. I don't know about that, but, but just consider this one thing. Why does Christianity completely and utterly 100% omit the story that provides context to everything else? Because Christianity is a Roman deception. It's not from God. It's from Yahweh. Yahweh is Jupiter. Jupiter built the Roman Empire. This is why Yeshua made the offhand comment, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. You've got these Jews worshipping Yahweh in their temple, and then you've got Jupiter, who built the Roman Empire, who is occupying Israel, persecuting these people. Why? Well, he probably knew that Yeshua was coming. Right? Herod wanted to know. Oh, you've seen a star? Oh, something about a king being born? Oh, oh, interesting. Huh. And we get to the story about Pilate. Let's go back there. So here, Yeshua is about to die. And he's before Pontius Pilate. And we have this bizarre conversation. I've got another study out there as well called uh, Yeshua and Pilate. Early in the morning, Jesus was taking, taken from Caiaphas's house to the governor's palace. The Jews wouldn't go into the palace. They didn't want to become unclean since they wanted to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What accusation are you making against this man? The Jews answered Pilate, Well, if he weren't a criminal... We wouldn't have handed him over to you. And Pilate told the Jews, take him and try him by your law. And the Jews answered, we're not allowed to execute anyone. In this way, what Jesus had predicted about how he would die came true. Pilate went back into the palace, called for Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, what did you think of that yourself? Or did others tell you about me? Now, here you've got this man who's about to be crucified. No, you should not pray to Yahweh. Um, he's about to be crucified. You know, how, how should you pray? Read the Lord's Prayer. You don't have to, like, I don't, I don't have to tell you these, like, it's in the text. Just go read the Lord's Prayer. You want to know how to pray? Go follow the advice of Yeshua. Just, it's here. It's in the text, right? Um... So, why is Yeshua, who's about to die, being antagonistic towards Pilate? Isn't he trying to save his own skin? This guy even tells him, you know, I have the power to set you free or to crucify you. And here he is as like being sarcastic and getting up in his face and not answering his questions. And let's, let's continue here. Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own people and the chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom doesn't belong to this world. 
If my kingdom belonged to this world, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. My kingdom doesn't have its origin on earth. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus replied, You're correct in saying that I am a king. I have been born and have come into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to me. And Pilate says, What is truth? We continue. So Pilate had Jesus taken away and whipped. They put a cape on him and we catch up in the story in verse 19, in chapter 19, verse 4. Pilate went outside again and told the Jews, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I don't find this man guilty of anything. Jesus then went outside. He was wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cape. Pilate said to the Jews, look, here's the man. When the chief priests and guards saw Jesus, they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate told them, you take him and crucify him. I don't find this man guilty of anything. And the Jews answered Pilate, we have a law and by that law he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Now listen very carefully, full attention right now. Listen to Pilate's response. The Jews had just told them that he had said he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard them say that, he became even more afraid than ever. Why? Why? you got this madman, right? He's, he's the Son of God. I mean, you, what would his response be? You'd go back and like, what are you, lunatic? You think you're the son of God? Oh, no, that's not how he reacts. It says he becomes more afraid than ever. Why? Why would Pilate care? He's the governor of Judah. Like he, he could execute, he's executing these people every day, all day. It's not a big deal. Why is he suddenly getting all fearful of this thinks he's the son of God. No, he, he doesn't take it flippantly. He is now dead freaking serious. Wait, what? When Pilate heard them say that he was the son of God, that he had said that he was the son of God, he became more afraid than ever. He went into the palace and asked Jesus, what would you ask Jesus when he said that? If you were Pilate, put yourself in Pilate's shoes. What would be the question you would ask this madman? You know, he said he's the son of God. He's like, oh, okay. I'll go back inside and what? Oh, hey, let's get you some, some, some medication, okay? <laughs> the son of God. Oh, woo -hoo, woo -hoo. no. No, no. He goes in and he says, where are you from? One of my five questions. What did Yeshua say about himself, his father, what he came to do, where he came from, what will soon take place? Where are you from? Why on earth? How does that have any relevance? The Jews had just said, we have to execute him because he claimed to be the son of God. And you're now afraid? Why? And you come to Jesus and you ask, where are you from? Where's the context? How does this make any sense? This is Pontius Pilate. He's a governor. He probably had never met any of the gods. He had probably never met Jupiter, Yahweh personally. But he knew they were real. He knew that Roman mythology, as we call it today, wasn't mythological at all. That the gods were completely real. The early church fathers were in general agreement that the Greek and the Roman pantheon of gods were the exact same people talked about in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, we have this word in, in the text called the Nephilim, right? And Christians make up stories, they redefine this word. They say, well, the Nephilim are the fallen ones. They're part of Satan's crew. No. What, is, what does Nephilim mean? 
The fallen ones, right. The ones who came down from above. The fallen ones, the ones who came down from above. Well, in Christianity, they have this concept of fallen, like, well, you've sinned and now you're in a fallen state. No, the word is not say. There's no such concept at this part of the text. There's, no, there's no, there's no, no, the original sin is before. No, there's no, like, this is, this is, this is a, these are Jewish and, and Christian concepts. These are not in the text. These are ideas. And these concepts have created a context for how we see the text. But this word here in Genesis chapter 6, right? So it says here, um, the number of people increased all over the earth and daughters were born to them. The sons of God, right? And, and if you're in a King James, it'll say the Nephilim saw that the daughters of other humans were beautiful. So they married any woman they chose, right? Um, or verse 4, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days as well as later. When the sons of God slept with the daughters of other humans and had children by them. And these children were famous long ago because they were hybrids. But this word Nephilim doesn't mean fallen like a bad person. It means the one that has come from above. Come down from above. Nephilim means the one that has come down from above. Not this ideological sinful fallen state. Right? When we look at these, these people, right, not humans, but people that we've been talking about, they have a name. They are called the Anunnaki. What does this word Anunnaki mean? It means the ones that have come down from above. It's exactly the same word. Nephilim is Anunnaki. This is a big mistake that almost everybody has made. Nephilim are not bad people. They're just, it's a name for the species. Nephilim are Anunnaki are Nephilim. There is no difference. You say, were they good or bad? Are humans good or bad? There's no point in asking the question. You know that there are good humans and bad humans. There are good Anunnaki, there are bad Anunnaki. There are good Nephilim, there are bad Nephilim. Right? But, but the majority of the early church fathers were in agreement that the Greek and Roman pantheon were not mythological whatsoever. They lived in that time. They said, no, they were the Nephilim talked about in Genesis chapter 6. They are the Anunnaki. They are the Anunnaki. It's, it's definitely confusing at first. There's got to relearn everything. But the great thing is, you already have the book to learn it all. You've just got to start reading it. You've got to read it. Okay, you've got to read it. So, we go back to the story of Pontius Pilate. He's a Roman governor. He's living in the period of time when the gods did show up. They were still hanging around. Jupiter walked around with Herod. Jupiter and Herod would have sat face to face and shared a meal. Just like Yahweh did in the Old Testament. I can't believe the number of Christians who think Yahweh never met face to face with anybody. It says it explicitly in the text that Yahweh met with Moses face to face as a man sits down with his friend. Moses prepared a meal and food for Yahweh. He asked them to come and sit and they brought them water and he brought them food and they shared meals together. Yahweh would, after talking with Moses, Yahweh would talk to, to Moses' second in charge. I've done another study called Yahweh the Physical God. We go through the texts that show clearly Yahweh was a person like you and me, flesh and blood. So, I'm going to keep going. I know that some of you have got things to do, and that's fine. But I'm, I'm, I, want to, I want to really fill in some of the blanks here for you. I want to keep cementing some of this for those of you that are doubting. And it's great to have doubt. Have all the doubt in the world. Right? So, now this makes a lot of sense. Pontius Pilate, he understands what's going on. When, when they say, well, this man said he's the son of, of God. Wait, what? He said what? And, and Pontius Pilate's now going to be remembering back to 30-odd years earlier going, wait, 
They were looking for a newborn. And he was going to be a king. He was going to be a king that had come from the gods. And he's thinking this in his head, and he's going, wait. He said what? He said he's the son of, of God? They knew the backstory. They knew Jupiter tried to overthrow Saturn. They knew that Enlil Nunamnir tried to overthrow Anu, that Yahweh had tried to overthrow the father, the real God. And so Pontius Pilate is thinking all this and going, holy shit. This is the one we were looking for 30 years ago. I, I don't want anything to do with this. No, 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 no. No, I'm, no, I'm not touching this. Are you kidding me? I know what these Jews do not. These Jews don't have a clue. I know what's going on. This is the one we were looking for. This is the one we tried to kill as an infant. This is the one that escaped to Egypt. And by the way, why did he escape to Egypt? That's another story. Oh my God. <clears throat> so when Pilate heard, so the Jews said, we have a law and by that law he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard them say that, he became more afraid than ever. He went into the palace again and asked Jesus, where are you from? Oh, oh, you're getting it now. Oh, you're getting it now. Oh, you're putting the dots together. You're connecting the dots. How did Jesus answer? He didn't. But Jesus didn't answer. Jesus knows. Oh, you worked out who I am. <laughs> oh, you clever man, you. When Pilate... So Pilate said to Jesus, Aren't you going to answer me? <laughs> Don't you know that I have the authority to free you or to crucify you? Oh, wait, it gets better. You think, oh, no, that can't possibly be the context. Okay, but there's more, and it is. Jesus answered Pilate, You wouldn't have any authority over me if it hadn't been given to you from above. That's why the man who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And when Pilate heard what Jesus said, he wanted to free him. Pilate got it. This is the untold story of the conversation between Yeshua and Pilate that no one, I think I'm the first person to have ever spoken of this. Pilate understood who he was. Pilate knew that, ha ha, yeah, I am not touching a son of the gods. Are you kidding? Yeah, I'm not having his blood on my hands. And so what did he do? He, he washed his hands and he said, I'm, the blood of this man is not on my hands. I'm having nothing to do with this. It all connects together. The Greek mythology, the Roman mythology, the ancient mythologies, what we have in our Bible today, it all comes together. The Christian story is subterfuge. It's, it's, a, it's a deflection. It's like, look over there, look over there. No, why don't we look here? Lo, lo, look in here. Look in here. No, no, no. I mean, Christians today don't even read the Bible. Just read the Bible. Download it from my website in audio. It's free. At least listen to the, to the, to the, the, the books on Jesus, the Gospels in the book of Revelation, listen to it over and over and over and over and over and over. Just put it on repeat just all day long for the rest of your life. Just listen, 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 listen. You start to see these things. I'm not making these things up. Let me show you one more thing. Because it's getting late, especially for those on the East Coast. So, has this been good? Have you got something from this? I love to teach Jesus. I love to teach Jesus. All 
<laughs> yeah, there's a lot to take. There's, there's a, this is very different to what Christianity teaches. But who built Rome? Jupiter, Yahweh, the adversary, Satan built Rome. Right? What's the, what's the emblem of the Roman Empire? The eagle. What's the emblem of Yahweh? The eagle. What's his title? Lord of the air. Right? In Lil, now we know that Enki means Lord of the water. Right? Enki means Lord of the water. What does Enlil mean? Right? Yahweh's name in the Sumerian text is Enlil. E N L I L. What does Enlil mean? It means Lord of the air. Lord of the air. Huh. Lord of the air. Lord of the air. Lord of the air. Lord of the air. Interesting. Lord of the air. That's what Enlil means. Lord of the air. Right? <clears throat> Let me get a different translation here real quick. I want to show you something that's going to bring all of this together. And you're just going to be like, wait, what? How's that even possible? Right? Lord of the air. In Lil, Yahweh means Lord of the air. Lord of the air. Lord of the air. Remember that. Lord of the air. <clears throat> Lord of the air. So we've got Yahweh that has blinded people to the very thing Yeshua tried to do for us in the garden, which was give us everything. He loves us unconditionally. But the Lord of the air in Lil. Yahweh, no, he didn't. He he doesn't care about us. He's our adversary. So Yahweh, Jupiter, creates this Christian mythology and a Jewish mythology through Torah, and through the Roman Empire creates Roman universalism, Roman Catholicism, Christianity. So, well, no, Christianity is okay. Look. What's the difference between Christianity and Catholicism? Like 1% of doctrine, right? Everything that Christianity teaches comes from Roman universalism. Everything. Everything. Okay? So Rome, Jupiter, Yahweh, Satan, Enlil, Nunamnir, all the same person, just different names and different languages, creates a religious system to hide all of this from us. So that we don't see what Yeshua was trying to do. And Paul wrote about this. And he said, And you were dead in the, trespass, dead in the trespasses in sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, the cult, the religious system, following the prince of the power of the air. What? Wait, and you were dead in the trespasses in sins and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, literally the title of Enlil Nunumnir, who is Yahweh and Satan. But what did he blind them from? What did he blind them from? We can go here and we can see here. So, when Yahweh, when, when Yeshua was running the earth, he was the God of this world. When Yahweh pulled rank, 
He became the God of this world. And he told the Jews, I am your God. I am the God that took you out of Egypt. And then I slaughtered you and destroyed you. So if the good news that we tell others is covered with a veil, it is hidden from those who are dying. The God of this world, oh, low power, we're going to have to go soon. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Satan is the God of this world. When was the world handed over to Satan? Well, we know in the ancient text it was handed over to Enlil Nunamnir, the second in charge, the one who tried to overthrow the kingdom. You start seeing, like, the more you learn, the more of these dots you're going to connect. You go, how have we never seen any of this before? But the majority of it, not 100% of it, but 95, you only need a little bit from the ancient text to provide some context. 95% of it is right in our Bible. And we haven't used anything tonight except the Bible. Now one of the strangest passages in the whole Bible in Jude. If I can find it, it's kind of hard to find Jude, even at the best of times. Right? One of the strangest verses in the whole Bible, this little book of Jude, where, I can't remember what verse it is, but it's very short, so I'll find it here in a second here. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay, so Jude, verse 9, it says here, <clears throat> um, when the archangel Michael argued with the devil, they were arguing over the body of Moses. When the archangel Michael argued with the devil, they were arguing over the body of Moses. But Michael didn't dare to hand down a judgment against the devil because he's the second in charge. Instead, Michael said, may the Lord reprimand you. Because he's the son of God. He's the most senior son of God. Yahweh is a son of God like Yeshua is a son of God. Now, Yeshua is the only begotten, the only one that came as a human. But why? Wait a minute here. Why in Jude does it say when the archangel Michael argued with the devil, they were arguing over the body of Moses? What does this mean? Why am I telling you this? Because only one person knew where the body of Moses was. Who personally buried Moses? And it looks like he killed Moses and then buried him. Who? Who was it that knew where the body of Moses was buried? Because he buried him. Do you know? Yahweh. Yahweh's the devil. Yahweh's the only one who knew where Moses' body was buried. He buried him himself. And here in Jude, we find this weird text that doesn't even seem to fit. Here is Moses, uh, here is Michael, arguing with the devil over the body of Moses. Oh well, yeah, they got his body eventually, but at some point, they, they got but Moses' body eventually. But at some point, you read it in Jude, verse 9. The archangel Michael had to come and collect the body of Moses to take it to heaven. Yahweh's the only one who knew where the body was. Yahweh killed him. Now, that doesn't explicitly say he killed him in the text. But he's talking with Moses, and then he says, and you're going to die here, and then he buries him. Seems that he killed Moses. But he most certainly buried Moses. And then you've got Michael, the archangel, arguing with the devil over the body. There's too much. There's 
too much in the text that says that, that Yahweh is the devil. There's just too much. I'm going to take you to one final thing, and I'm going to say a few words and we'll close out. <clears throat> so, there was a time where Yahweh instituted a census, and it seems from the text that he branded them, just like Revelation 13, where he's going to brand them again, right? And in 2 Samuel 24, we read about this census being organized by Yahweh. So it says in 2 Samuel chapter 24, Again, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. Well, it's very odd. Very odd, because the Bible records this story twice. It records it in 2 Samuel 24 and also in 1 Chronicles 21. The exact same story. So, let me read it again. Again, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel and he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah. That's how it's written in 2 Samuel 24. But that's not how it's written in 1 Chronicles 21. In 1 Chronicles 21, the word adversary in Hebrew is used for the very first time in the Bible. Let me read what it says. You think, no, oh, this is Yahweh can't possibly be Satan, the adversary, right? Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number. Israel. The Bible itself tells us that Yahweh is the adversary, Satan. It says it in black and white. Christianity doesn't tell us about this. Why? Because Christianity is Roman universalism, is the deception of Yahweh himself, where he has made himself God. And he's not God. He's the one who set himself up as God. He is the God of this world. <clears throat> he's the God of this world. <clears throat> so if the good news that we tell others is covered with a veil, it is hidden from those who are dying. The God of this world, Yahweh, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe in Yeshua. As a result, they don't see the light of the good news about Yeshua's glory. It is Yeshua who is God's image. Yahweh is trying to be the replacement. In Hosea 13, we see Yahweh saying, I am the only Savior. No, you're not. Yeshua is the only Savior. This is the gospel of the kingdom. Yeshua said that when the gospel of the kingdom, this whole kingdom of all these interesting players, the fact that they occupy heaven, this other planet, the planet of the crossing, The fact that we have all these pantheons of gods around the world, but they're all the same people. You can go to Hinduism and look at Shiva and Vishnu and Brahma, and you see the same thing going on there. Shiva is Yahweh. Vishnu is Yeshua. The, the water god, the one who's blue, like... Neptune is blue, Poseidon is blue, Vishnu is blue. They are the lords of the water. Yeshua is the 
Lord of the Water. So, Earth was created, or Earth was terraformed to make it habitable. They came here to extract minerals. <coughs> there was, uh, well, Allah, what about Muslims, someone asked, Allah is Yahweh, same deal. Allah is Yahweh. <coughs> um, Muslims don't like me saying that, but I have a, a dear Muslim friend who uh, I think was quite upset when I first said that, and now he, he financially supports me, which is just wonderful. I appreciate it. He doesn't want me to name his name at all and for, for good reason. Um, so they brought a bunch of them here to mine. They got sick and tired of it. They wanted out. Our Lord, our Creator, Yeshua, said, Hey, I can create the human. I can create a man, do the work for us. He became totally unhappy when his brother took over and put everyone into bondage. He saw them just as slaves. He didn't see them as slaves. They were his creation. But Yahweh took over. He stole Yeshua's people out of Egypt. We've talked a little bit about Egypt before. We won't, we won't go over it now because we want to close up. But Jesus built Egypt. That's why his people were there. Yahweh comes and says, I'm taking your people. I'm going to steal, kill, and destroy your people. That's why he says, I am your God from Egypt. He wasn't their God before then. He was their God from Egypt. So you have to leave all your other gods behind. I'm your only God now. Tries to wipe out Yeshua's people. And then we have Yeshua come and say, I am coming to complete and fulfill Yahweh's law to destroy the works of the enemy. And he says to the Jews, your father, the devil, who was a murderer from the beginning. He said that all who came before me are thieves and robbers. Yahweh is before him. He lays down his own life to complete this ridiculous law that his brother had imposed on his own people. That's why he said, I came to my own and they did not receive me. He didn't care. He said, you have not chosen me. I have chosen you. Right? And he lays down his own life. He conquers death. And then he promises us that he will restore everything back to us as we read about in Revelation 22. I love this passage. I'm going to read it again. Oh, come on. There's so many studies on the end of this Bible. The angel showed me a river filled with the water of life, as clear as crystal. It was flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. And between the street of the city and the river, there was a tree of life visible from both sides. And it produced 12 kinds of fruit. Each month had its own fruit. And the leaves of the tree will heal the nations. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will worship Him and see His face. Right? Only special people are allowed to see Yahweh's face. His name will be on their foreheads instead of the branding that Yahweh gave them. There will be no more night and they will not need any light from lamps or the sun because the Lord God will shine on them. They will rule as kings forever and ever. You know, everything that's going on now appears that he is on his way back here. I don't know when. I'm not a prophet. I, I don't have any... I just, I'm paying attention and being observant. And I think that uh, we're at the cusp of things occurring right now. I think that within a decade, within 10 years from now, Yeshua would have returned. 
talks in Revelation about this enormous vessel that's going to come down out of the sky, this massive cube that can take every single person on the planet, even if the population was multiplied, I think, by like 80. And he says he's going to eventually destroy this earth and take us to a different planet, a new heaven and a new earth. And so the old things will be passed away, there'll be new things. And I think that this is about to happen very, very soon. I don't know, but I do think. So this has definitely been a very different Christmas story than you've ever heard before. But I, I really hope that you've, I really hope you fall in love with Yeshua. I really hope that you will turn to the text. I really hope that you will use those five basic, simple questions to start to learn to recognize his voice. What did he say, Yeshua, what did he say about himself, his father, what he came to do, where he came from, and what will soon take place? You read through the Gospels and you answer those five questions and you're on your way home. There's nothing more important than being able to recognize his voice. Even right now, there are people I, people sending me messages saying, this guy claims to be the reincarnation of Jesus. This guy over here claims to be the reincarnation. Oh, this guy is saying he's the Messiah. And Yeshua spoke really, really plainly about this. He said, many are going to come in my name and deceive many. Don't listen to them. Don't listen to them. He said that when he comes, it will be like lightning flashing from east to west. Everybody will see it. There will be no mistake that the king has arrived. Don't, don't be put off over the next few years. If this is it, there will be so many people that will seem so incredibly influential they will deceive many. It says even God's elect will be deceived by these people. They'll be so hungry for a Messiah to come and rescue us. No. When he comes, it'll be the biggest fireworks display you've ever seen. The sky will light up. Everyone is going to know exactly what is going on. There will be an alien invasion it will be completely obvious. Everyone's going to be streaming it on their phones. Everyone's going to see it instantly. There will be no hiding it. So do not accept any substitutes, including Christianity, which is a substitute gospel. It is another gospel. Says, look over here. Look over here. Don't, no, don't look at this other stuff. No, it's not, it doesn't exist. Psalm 82 is not there. No, all these things are not there. He didn't say what he said in John 8. No, no, no. No, it wasn't really Yahweh that killed man in the garden. No, 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 no. Let us tell you what everything means. No, read the text. It's time for a completely religion-free experience of simply following in his footsteps. We don't need anything but him. Many of us are going to die if this is it. I'm going to die. You're going to die. Many of us are going to be slaughtered. Well, you've got to get the mark. No, I'm not getting your mark. Well, then you're going to be executed. Okay, well, that's just the way it is. And that's okay. Because nothing matters except following him. He came. He was born into this world. He has died He's come back to life. He's been building another premises for us to go and occupy. And soon he's going to return. And he's going to destroy the armies of this world. And he's going to reign on this earth as its rightful king. Like he did in the beginning. The restoration of all things. Hmm. 
Well, I've had a wonderful night talking with you. I, I, you know, I, I hope you've really gotten a lot out of this. If you've joined us late, I know there's a lot to get through. I've drained my whole battery. It was 100% before we started, and it's about to die. So, um, so thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for trusting me to, to share some things with you tonight. Um, even though this is not the real birthday of Jesus, it's still a great day to be focused on him. Every day is a great day to be focused on him. So may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you shalom, peace, as only he can give us. All right? You have a wonderful, wonderful night. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.